This episode is brought to you by Windrose Recovery, a family of premier addiction treatment programs in southeastern Wisconsin. Privately owned, Windrose Recovery offers a full continuum of personalized care for those struggling with addiction, including the Manor for Residential Treatment, Midwest Detox for Inpatient Detoxification, and Windrose Counseling for Outpatient Treatment. With highly personalized treatment focused on trauma, Dr. Chantal Thomas and her expert team offer an authentic experience, creating the kind of deep emotional change that's crucial for long-term recovery. If you or someone you love is struggling with addiction, call Windrose Recovery at 414-409-5300. You can learn more about Windrose Recovery by clicking the link in the show notes or by visiting windroserecovery.com. Thank you for listening to The Path to Authenticity. My name's Tom Gentry. I think of this show as the opposite of small talk. You'll hear real conversations with real people who know who they are. We talk about what makes them who they are, how they became who they are, and how we might become truer expressions of who we are. I'm Eric Bricker, and this is The Path to Authenticity. the Santa Monica Mountains, her escape vortex offers a unique and truly fantastic setting for your next spiritual retreat. The Lavender Garden, the fire pit overlooking the Topanga Canyon sunset, and the Moroccan furnished yurt on this magical property provide the atmosphere for an inspiring and transformative experience. A sacred place ideal for yoga and wellness retreats as well as cleansing and healing ceremony of all kinds, Her Escape Vortex is part of a community of people eager for personal and spiritual growth. Visit thepathtoauthenticity.com slash herescapevortex or click on the link in the show notes for more information. If this is your first time here, thanks for checking it out. If not... Thanks for coming back. I'm Tom Gentry, and this is The Path to Authenticity. Episode 136 for August 10th, 2021. If you have followed me on social media, specifically lately on Instagram, then you might know I'm helping a friend of mine launch a podcast of his own. It's my friend Eric Bricker, who is a licensed mental health counselor specializing in grief and addiction in Boca Raton, Florida. And the podcast is called Good Counsel, the Helping People's Podcast. So, this is a project that I've been working on and It's the first, aside from my own, that I've helped produce. We're recording the interview for his first episode tomorrow. And I thought it'd be good just to have him on the show, talk about what he's doing, why he's doing it, some thoughts behind it. And then I also wanted to talk about grief. Because one of the things I've noticed in life And in my work is that often there are types of losses that we don't really think about and it's hard to grieve an unacknowledged loss. So we get into that a little bit. Eric and I go back a long, long time. It's the most enduring and consistent friendship. That I've had since I moved to Florida in 1996. I met him in the spring of 1998. We worked together at an addiction treatment facility and just became buddies right away. He's a few years older than me. I always looked up to him. 
and we've just stayed in each other's lives. He left that job a few years before I did and moved on to do bigger and better things. But we have always stayed in touch. And at one point, as I was training to become an addictions counselor, or specifically 10 years later when I hadn't finished my internship or tested to become an addictions counselor, Eric finished my supervision with me, and then I tested and became certified. That was in 2009 after doing all the other work in 2000, 2001. So he's been a big help to me and a mentor to me and a friend to me. And I'm excited about this project because he's excited about this project. So we're having a lot of fun. So here we go. Enjoy my conversation with Eric Bricker. So I was thinking about the last time that you were at my apartment when you came over to record the last time. Episode 20 is what it was. Um, what episode are you up to now? I just, I'll release 135 on Tuesday. That's a lot of, that's it's a lot crazy. of talking. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's a lot of talking. That's a lot of talking. But I was thinking about, you came to my place and it was the first time you'd been here. Try not to do that. I'm sorry. That was an accident. <laughs> so... It was the first time you had been here, and I remember you going to the bathroom and coming out and commenting on all my toiletries. You had a lot of grooming supplies. <laughs> you really did. And they looked, um, there's a very eclectic mix of things, and some of which I didn't know what they were. Yeah. Like several different combs and accoutrements of different <laughs> sorts. And I was like, wow, Tom, is that what it takes to keep someone so well quaffed as you? <laughs> I have like two things. Now you're going to make me learn how to spell quaff. If if I'm going to release a transcript of this, I'm going to have to spell quaff. C-O-I-F-F-E, something like that. Sure. <laughs> um, and I want you to know there's probably like a 70% possibility. I'd say like 50% possibility that I use that word incorrectly as well. Well, if you're talking about my hairdo, you didn't use it incorrectly. All right, I used it correctly. Did you, were you talking about my hair or were you talking about the whole thing? I was sort of like hairdo and um, just overall grooming. <laughs> I don't know why I got into the habit of buying so much stuff like that. It was I exceptional, man. I remember like four <laughs> brass combs and some of them look like pre-Civil War. No brass combs. I think I saw like a wooden equestrian brush in there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a hairbrush. But I have a couple wooden hairbrushes. I have like good combs and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, that was it. Was an exceptional collection. <laughs> My barber shit isn't that yeah. good. Well, usually that's the junk, dude. I'll have you know, I go to sports clips. So if this podcast turns into a video podcast, I think you're gonna have to do a notch better than sports clips. You think so? Well, I mean, yeah. Gotcha. I'm trying to think of the last time I went to Supercuts or something like that. It's been a while. I need some cat named Sergio to cut my hair. No, no, like Tommy. I got a guy named Tommy. Okay, gotcha. He works at an Aveda salon. I had a guy named Cineo. That was close. He cut Bernie Madoff's hair for 20 years, this guy. Probably still waiting to get paid. <laughs> but he's just the nicest guy in the world. You'd go in there. I mean, there were alligator skin chairs, the barber chairs. He nice, had man alligator skin and he'd make you an espresso or a cappuccino if you wanted it was like the real deal it was a cool place anyway i don't know how we got on all that stuff i guess we were talking about my wealth of grooming supplies and so now here we are you're doing a podcast i am it is called good counsel the helping people's podcast that's right so why a podcast so it's this idea that I'm a psychotherapist and 
beyond therapy, there's all these different types of ways of helping, right? There's all these kind of helping relationships, ways in which one person counsels, mentors another. And the idea of helping relationships, it goes back in some cultures like thousands of years. In Homer's Odyssey, one of the characters was named Mentor. The word mentoring comes from that. That's where it came from. Yeah, the character Mentor, who was Odysseus's counsel. As many courses as I took where I read that and studied it, I should know that. But I was the kid who never read it. I just, you know. They hide a lot of that information on Wikipedia. <laughs> but but um, <laughs> nah, They didn't have Wikipedia when I'm talking about. That's true. That's true. Yeah, so it, it's really an exploration into that and all of the different places where it exists. And my hope was that by starting this, it would kind of cause me to you know, make exploration of that and find different people that were counseling other people in, in different formats, life coaches, youth counselors, youth pastors, all these different sort of people, case managers, doctors. I want to talk to everybody mm-hmm. and just really kind of explore what people are out there are doing that are helping other people. And I thought it'd be, I thought it'd be like a fun thing. But also... One of the things I've noticed is how much enthusiasm you've had for this. And I wish this was a video podcast right now so everybody could see my dog trying to make out with you, licking your neck. Caesar likes me. He does. He likes you. I like Caesar. He's my friend. Yeah, he is. Getting back to what I was saying, you have a lot of enthusiasm. This is satisfying something in you, right? I'm a huge fan of Howard Stern and equally Joe Rogan. And I love the idea of long form interviews. And these guys are really the best at it. A couple hours talking to people, you get a sense of who the guests are in ways that you can never get access to them in any other mainstream media. You're not going to hear that version of Joseph Gordon Levitt's story about whatever movie he's making from a clip on entertainment tonight, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just different. You take a deep dive into who people are. And I love that style of interviewing people and getting to know them and finding out what inspires people. And really through being a, a fan of Howard Stern and actually reading from his books and learning a little bit about how he interviews people, I've adopted some of that into psychotherapy and found it to be extremely helpful in building rapport with people and getting people to talk more about things that might even seem innocuous or mundane aspects of their lives, but actually kind of clue you into a lot about who the individual is. Mm -hmm. So all of that is just fascinating to me. And now I've reached a point in my life, really through my relationship with you, where I'm like, there's an opportunity where I could try this out, and I'm going to do it in an area that I understand, Mm -hmm. which is these counseling relationships. So I had all these people in my mind that I know that I want to start with and will keep it to an area that I understand well. Yeah. And there's really an appetite for this sort of stuff right now. I hope so. Yeah, I think so. Who are you targeting with this podcast? That's a funny thing that you say that because we talked about that before. And I, I, you know, obviously if you're creating some piece of media, you should have some idea of who's going to be listening to it. And the fact of the matter is, that's not really entirely clear to me. I imagine maybe other therapists would like it. I imagine people who are interested in behavioral health care, maybe consumers of behavioral health Or becoming health care. a therapist, someone who wants to be a therapist. I could see where people like that might want to hear it, or people who receive these services, or people who are thinking they might need these kinds of services, mm-hmm. or just people who are interested in learning what other people are doing. You know, it's not entirely clear to me. I just really want to do it. And that to me, it almost provides you with a certain amount of freedom because I'm not attached to like an expected outcome. Right. There's nothing that I'm looking for that I'm going to gain out of this more so than the satisfaction of having created it and put it out there. Mm -hmm. So it's really in a way trying to see if I have the ability to create art of this medium. Well, I believe you do. Tanner Campbell, been podcasting since 2009, 
Now he helps other people. He's a consultant and a, I don't think he calls himself a podcast coach. You know, people pay him to help them with this sort of thing. I asked him about what advice does he have for someone who wants to do a podcast as to how they arrive at what they're going to do a podcast about, right? Because there are a lot of people, especially now, that are doing podcasts more and more all the time. And a lot of times I've heard people say, and I felt this way before I kind of figured out what I wanted to do. I want to do one, but I don't know what I want it to be about, right? So I asked him what advice he would have for that person. And he said, instead of trying to create something that you know people will listen to, try to create something that you're passionate about, that you know you'll stay engaged with and be consistent with, and they will find you. That too many people try to create something that they think will be consumed rather than something that they actually want to create. And starting this, I talked to some other podcasters and they'd say things like, well, you got to, you know, you you don't want it to be more than 25 minutes long because nobody will listen to it. And, you know, you don't want to play the whole song because then they won't listen to it. And you have to have a call to action every 15 minutes and all this shit. It's like, I know that a lot of people would say you should do all those things. I don't want to do any of those. Things. Like, I don't want to do any of that yeah, either. Yeah. So, and I just kind of decided at that point, I'm going to create what I want to create. I'm going to carry out this vision I have and I'll find the people or they'll find me. And I've been doing it a little over two years now. And I was looking at the numbers yesterday and, you know, I'm not setting any records or setting the world on fire, but it's, consistently the numbers are rising. I've had sponsors and I feel like I've done some pretty good work, you know? Well, watching you do it and knowing you for a long time and even in some of the early conversations that we had when you were new to this and just getting started and seeing your enthusiasm and talking to you when you bought your first set of microphones and recorded some stuff. I think he gave me a call. You're like, Hey, I'm doing this thing. Check it out on Facebook, listen to it and seeing what it's evolved to from there. You know, clearly there's a lot of growth. Part of what inspires me to do this is one, my love for the medium, but also the fact that I've seen somebody that I'm close to that does it and did Mm -hmm. it well and is, is enjoying success because you and I talk a lot about the places that it takes you. And granted, The places that it's taking you are really kind of the places that I want to go. I don't imagine that I'm going to become Joe Rogan. I mean, that's ridiculous. I have no ambition for any kind of massive notoriety. I don't see that happening to me. And it's not really something I need or want. It's more about, like, for example, my first guest um, meeting with next week. I'm really excited to meet with him. His name is Andrew Baker. He's a university professor and clinical director of a treatment center and a really, really smart and engaging and interesting guy who has published his own research. And I know I could create an interesting conversation with him because he's a great talker, a very articulate and engaging guy. So I'll have him in there. I know what I want to know from him. I want to know what inspires the research. I want him to tell us, tell people about what the research is. And you know who I know is going to listen to that? This guy's family, right? probably his students, maybe his colleagues, and people that I know that are interested in that kind of thing. And if that's as far as it gets, that's good enough for me. And maybe one of his university professor colleagues listens to that and says, hey, you know what? I would like to be interviewed in a similar manner and talk about my research with this guy. you know, Or maybe they won't say that, but that's enough for me. Little small steps to keep myself engaged with people who are in this kind of work and just see where it takes me. Hmm. Well, one of the things that I've really liked about doing it, and you mentioned someone's family. One of the most pleasant surprises about this is the type of response that I've gotten from people's family members. Just because, I mean, I want to go deep and hear about people's lives and careers and 
somebody's grandkids listens to the, they get to see a side of their family member they didn't know about. They get to know a person better. It gives me chills to think about. I would have never guessed that. <laughs> your dog is currently <laughs> walking. We're having this important moment. I think your dog has clearly been overindulged, man. <laughs> It's an entitled animal. I like him, though. I like he's, him. He's, okay. he, he's cool. He's definitely a lap dog. Yeah. He's cool. He's just kind of sitting there on your lap. The other part about it that I really have liked is that it's just enlarged my life. The people who I've met and become friends with as a result of this, I never would have imagined. I guess it's because I didn't have a lot of expectations about it, like you're talking about. You don't either. and. I think that's probably good, and you'll probably be surprised. What you're talking about is exactly what I want mm-hmm. at school. If I meet some interesting people, I get it done, I'm happy with it, it circulates around. It's a, a platform of getting people to know me too, right? promoting my private practice. But even that, I don't, because there's much more efficient and less time-consuming ways to do that right? than to take all of this time and invest all this resource into it. So even that is kind of really secondary Mm -hmm. to the creative part of it. Right. Right. And the creative part of it is something that you're looking to satisfy too, right? That's the most. I'm starting to line up guests and talk to different people that I want to interview. So Andrew has agreed to do this and he'll be the first one I talk to. And there's another therapist, and she's awesome. Her name is Dawn DeChico Mains, and I've worked with her for a while at Karen Renaissance. And prior to that, when I was working for the Seminole Tribe, I used to interact with her a lot. And she's an expert on something called DBT, Dialectic Behavior Therapy. And probably of all the people I know is the most knowledgeable in terms of practical application, supervising other people who are using this technique with clients and working with clients with a high level of acuity, like people who are really impaired. So, you know, she's really super talented in using this in all the different ways that you want to use it. And so we'll talk about that. And I know that that will be an interesting conversation for me and for some people, not everybody. People who know about DBT know it's the application is mostly for personality disorder which includes narcissistic personality disorder. And if there's one psychiatric issue, people are being labeled narcissists all over the place. It's all over social media to the point where I think it's overused. So maybe that's something you could get insight from her about that, what her thoughts are on that. Absolutely. Well, one of the angles that I want to take with her on it is that Dialectic behavior therapy was really originally designed for treating the borderline personality disorder. Right. And the interesting thing about borderline personality disorder is that there's a heavy gender bias there in terms of a lot of labeling for difficult female therapy clients are often given the borderline label. Right. And so she is also an advocate for women. So I'm really interested to hear from her about gender bias, about the gender bias with diagnostic labels, about the implication for that in choosing what sort of therapeutic technique you're going to use. Like that, mm-hmm. I feel like that's a conversation in and of itself and probably one that she would want to have because it aligns with her worldview. So I know that bringing that up with her that's going to be a really engaging thing. And I think that that's an interesting conversation. to have. Andrew Baker, the other guy that I'm going to talk to, the university professor, he has done some original research on coding therapeutic connections between clients and therapists. And there's a way to kind of code and track the interactions that's associated with outcomes. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of tell through kind of coding certain things that occur during the interaction, whether these two people are clicking, whether this is working, whether it's likely, Mm. whether this client is fully engaged in a way that's going to be meaningful for them. That could be tracked in an objective way. That's interesting. Well, that's the system that he's worked to develop because he's, you know, a university professor who trains counselors. So part of it is for training of these counselors in the university setting. And the other one is for 
developing something that kind of furthers efficiency in this field. Mm -hmm. He sent me his research articles. Now I got to keep up with him by trying to read these research articles and understand them so that I could talk to him as intelligently as possible about what he's done Mm -hmm. so that he won't feel like he's alone trying to explain this to somebody who really just interviews people but doesn't have any subject matter knowledge. Right. So all of those things kind of stretch and challenge you to do a little bit more. And I think that that's good for me. Absolutely. So anything else you want people to know about the podcast? I want it to be good. And I hope that people will give it an opportunity. And I hope that it finds the people who are interested in this subject matter. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it. It's helping me because I feel like there are other people I can do this with. And so you being my friend and helping you do it, it's like giving me an opportunity to help someone launch a podcast and see if that's something that I want to do more of. And I also feel like it's an opportunity for me to use the benefit of hindsight of what I would have done differently with my podcast in the beginning to kind of kick it off in a stronger way because I was pretty trepidatious about it. And I could have used someone who I trusted and liked who had done it to, to say to me, go for it. Just do it. Don't hold back. So I'm excited, man. I'm excited about it. I'm glad we're doing this. Thank you. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk about it. We'll get the word out more and more. And hopefully by the time it comes out, there will already be people ready to check it out. That's the plan. Obviously, this podcast that I do, what really inspired it as much as anything was the fact that as an emerging adult, I kind of gave up on what I really wanted to do with my life. Probably did it a couple times over. The first, you know, I I decided I wasn't going to continue to try to play baseball. That was a big one. I, you know, I had a teacher that told me at one point, he was asking, sixth grade, he was asking a bunch of us, what do, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to be a major league baseball player. And he's like, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's one in a million. And I'm like, I'm going to be that one in a million. He's like, I don't know. And I kept playing for a few more years, but it made it easier to quit when I did quit. And what I didn't realize back then as a kid that maybe I won't play Major League Baseball. In fact, I probably won't play Major League Baseball, but I'll be around the people I want to be around. I'll be in baseball. I love it more than anything. You know, I might, maybe I'll be a coach. Maybe I just want to live a life where I play as many innings as I possibly can until I have to quit. That's that's honestly the one thing I would do differently in life if I could go back is just play as much baseball as I possibly could. So that set the tone for me to kind of give up on a couple other things, too, very early on. And then the next thing you know, I'm 23 years old and I nearly drink myself to death. And I was grieving something. Those things were losses. And I don't want to overstate that. I don't, I don't want to say it like I experienced something different than what a lot of other people experience, which is my point. I think a lot of us experience things like this. And we go through life without acknowledging that grief, without actually grieving it. And I know, like you, working with a lot of people with substance abuse issues, I've met an awful, I have good friends who ruined their athletic careers by drinking or drugs. And that is a big wound that goes largely unacknowledged when people are being treated. So when you engage in the process of grief and loss is wide standing thing. And 
I think for the most part, part we think about grief and loss or the counseling of grief and loss as something that's associated with losing people, but it's also associated people benefit from counseling of grief and loss for grieving the loss of things that they never had or grieving the loss of what could have been. And this whole idea, because even with substance use disorders, at some point in the family system, Oftentimes, there's that pivotal moment of reconciling with somebody's parents. He's not going back to law school. Right. Like, talking about taking the LSATs, that's not the conversation we need to have. The conversation we need to have is what transitional housing is the best for your son at this time. And oftentimes, with family or with people, the acceptance that the trajectory that someone was on that's a little bit waylaid at the moment. You might get back to it. You might get back to it. You might come back stronger than ever. But for some people, you know, these windows of periods of time are, are, are gone. And I think coming to acceptance of certain things like that, certain losses actually helps people in recovery because now you can, instead of dealing Mm. with the reality that should have been of why didn't my marriage work out and, kind of being stuck in that time period, we could now be a little bit more forward thinking or now be a little bit more present to what's going on now and where the opportunities are, reconciling what that was and getting to a place of acceptance about it. Well, in so much of dysfunction, be it with drugs or whatever, is about avoiding the emotional experience. If a person or a family is in that place, they're essentially in denial of what's actually going on. So they're not experiencing the sadness that comes with that loss. And that doesn't just disappear because we don't feel it, right? It's still there, whether we try to ignore it or not. And for me, a lot of, you mentioned families and their expectations or ideas of what the person should do. A lot of families have a hard time with that and have a hard time letting go of that. And that was true for me. With my family, it was more about their fear with some of the, like when I was in high school, I had teachers encouraging me to write. And my family just didn't see the possibilities with that. And I had people say to me, well, what are you going to do? Work at McDonald's so you can write? You know, it was a factory town. You either had a skilled trade or you worked in a factory. That's what most people did. They just didn't see it. But that really influenced me. And I sort of adhered to their expectations, which is where I lost the dream, where I lost the dream. I let go of it myself. But I also see a lot of parents who... I talk about this one case I worked on from time to time where it was a young adult male, loved to play guitar. He had gone away to college and and nearly drank himself to death, like was found with his head bashed in on a curb somewhere. And he went away to a military school because his stepdad wanted him to. And he pursued an accounting degree because his mom wanted him to. and. I'm working with him with three, six months sobriety and working with his parents. And all I'm hearing from them is, well, you know, he only has a couple credits left for that accounting degree. He doesn't want to be an accountant. (laughs) He doesn't want to be an accountant. And it kept coming up over and over and over again. And finally, I got to a point where, I mean, and I didn't do this lightly. The point needed to be made. Do you want a dead accountant or do you want a son who's relatively happy, who works at Guitar Center and plays in bands on the weekends and is sober? Which would you rather add? Because that's what we're talking about. And so many families, they project their fears onto their kids. I'm afraid he or she won't be able to achieve this, so I'm going to push him to do something I know he can achieve, right? And we're so uh, 
I just feel like we're so off track in our culture that we, we lose touch of what's in our hearts. And sometimes it's because of society. Sometimes it's because of family or it's both or, you know, I just, one of the guests I had recently, this guy, Lee McCormick, he's all about heart reconnection. And he talks a lot about getting out of our minds and back into our hearts where we belong. I just think there's a lot of grief out there. And, and I really, I want to help people get back to doing what makes them happy. And the podcast, the guests that I have on, you know, my hope is that they hear stories that inspire them to say, hey, I can do that. If this person can do that, I can do that. I just think that dream, it's such a common loss that goes unacknowledged because like you said, we generally think of loss as including the death of someone we love. And that's about it. When I was working at Karen Renaissance, um, I did the, the grief and loss group there. And actually, I still do it uh, on a consulting basis. I go in there once a week. And I really enjoy doing it there. Uh, the rest of the program is platformed very well to kind of support a specialty group for that. So mm -hmm. they're receiving individual treatment plan work around this. So these people are kind of prepped for the experience of diving into grief and loss. And there is a handout that they give there. It was the first place I saw it. I forget the, the author's name, but it, the title of it was Grieving the Loss of Dreams. And we would occasionally get people in the group who were athletes or people who were divorced or people who had given up certain careers or, or lost opportunities, maybe lost a business, had lost opportunities. And the focus of, they'd be there right alongside of people who had, were grieving the loss of family members, and they would be right alongside of them trying to come to some sort of solution or some kind of reconciliation about losing this other thing, this, this dream that they had. Mm -hmm. And now what? Well, that's interesting because that that is the big question. That's the big question because sometimes there's a secondary gain to being hung up in something that we've lost, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you said, if I am hung up on losing this opportunity to be a professional musician, say, and my life is really about lamenting this because I made it so far and I couldn't make it the rest of the way and now it's gone. And I'm stuck at that place and I'm, there's not forward movement. There's not some level of acceptance and reconciliation about that. That actually can serve as a secondary gain. It can actually serve as this kind of catalyst that keeps me stuck right where I am. So that drinking and self-destruction and irresponsible behaviors or, or a lack of accountability for where I'm at and trying to move forward that becomes acceptable because if I can't be this, then I'm nothing. Right. This is often what happens to people who just so heavily attach themselves to these ideas, these constructs that we create, like the construct of my son, the accountant. What does that right. even really mean? It's not even a tangible thing. It's an idea. It's a construct. It's something that we've created, but you create it and you attach so much importance to it. And you put so much energy into it and it becomes a real thing. It becomes a real thing to you. And yet this kid who's inebriated on the sidewalk being beaten to death and has no interest in becoming an accountant will remain three credits short of graduating into eternity. Right. Is as far from being as an accountant as you or, you or I. Right. Right. You know? right. <laughs> right. Right. And he did, you know, he didn't want to be no. an accountant. And I think part of one of the conclusions I've drawn doing this and thinking about this and writing about this is what we want as human beings is really, really important. It's important in our relationship to ourselves, our relationships with others. My dad would have turned 95 on the 27th a few days ago. And, you know, I wrote something about how I could always kind of sense his sadness, even though I 
you know, even when I was too little to understand what it was. But what I know now is he didn't have the life he wanted. And he didn't go through life talking about that. He pretended like that wound didn't exist. But it did. It did. He was sad. And that had ripple effects. You know, that affected his mood, his outlook, his ability to show up for me in certain ways. When a person goes through life unfulfilled and at least to some degree miserable, it doesn't benefit anyone else either. So even if you think that getting the factory job or the skilled trade or the accounting degree or whatever it is, is going to benefit other people, whether it benefits you or not, it's not. It's a funny thing along those lines. I had a profound realization about that too, from a conversation that I had with my own father. And uh, we were talking about happiness, the idea of happiness. And he said, you know, the generation before him, these immigrants that came from Eastern Europe, came to the United States and they worked these jobs and they lived, they worked really hard. They sacrificed for the future generations. He said that one of the things that kept them in his mind, one of the things that kept them going and made their lives possible the way they were was that they didn't have the expectation of happiness. They didn't come from a place where people were happy. They didn't expect to be happy. They just, they were hopeful that they could have more than what they had. And so it's funny, the idea of future generations and the expectations that we should be happy or we could be happy and you should strive for happiness. It's great that that exists here and that we have the freedom to pursue that, but it also creates a certain burden because Mm. if you're not happy or you haven't worked to be happy, you're going to be profoundly aware of it. Everybody. Right. You may not speak, you may be doing that thing. Uh, I forget who the author was that said that most men live lives of quiet desperation. Thoreau. Thoreau. Most men live lives of quiet desperation. You may be in that, but even those people who are in that have some awareness of what their lives were supposed to have been. Hmm. Yeah, and for my dad, it was, his dad left when he was a little kid. You know, had to work from the time he was like eight, literally. And it was the Great Depression. You know, life was really hard. Then growing up, getting married, having eight kids. Physically, he was always there, which was so much better than what he had. So it's relative. It sounds like he was in a position where he had to sacrifice a lot for the people that he was taking care of. And... The luxury of self-pursuit, the luxury of happiness, probably seemed like an indulgence that was beyond his reach. It wasn't something you prioritized. You worked hard and you sacrificed for the benefit of the people who need you. Mm -hmm. Well, and then, you know, I think the answer is ultimately, of course... You know, I feel like if we do what we want to be doing with our lives, we're going to be better. We're going to feel better. We're going to be happier. We're going to be uh, of better service to the world. But also there's the mindfulness aspect of things. The idea that if I can't be happy washing dishes, I can't be happy. Happiness isn't about what you achieve or what you do. It's a state of mind. One of my favorite quotes that you hear not frequently enough in the self-help world is an Abraham Lincoln quote, which is most people are about as happy as they decide to be. And again, I think that there's a lot of secondary gain in the choice to be unhappy or the investment in unhappiness because that often mitigates or removes from me the responsibility to pursue happiness. If I create a reality around me in which I am unhappy, I mean that's usually the people who are kind of more externalized in their sense of responsibility for themselves and their own well-being. It's usually 
people who are kind of more in a victim place that are doing that. But there's a lot of gain to it where it's, you know, I'm continuously unhappy and it's almost like the villain at the end of Scooby-Doo. I would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for these meddling kids, you know, and then you live your whole life pointing fingers at your shitty parents or your shitty boss or your shitty spouse or the shitty society or whatever, whoever the villain of the day is that's withholding from you the opportunity, Mm. you know, that really we should have hopefully pursued on our own and maybe still can. Mm. And that's the message of hope, right? You may not have done it yet. You may not have gotten there, but you can still take a shot. I'm a big believer in that too. And uh, that's a, a message of hope that I want to give to the world because I was a person who always wanted to be a private practitioner. My version of working in the helping professions was really myself in an office doing this thing on my own. That was the way I drew it up at the beginning. And for a long time, I was unwilling to make that leap out of fear and at points in my career became resentful of other people who had done it and started to create reasons outside of myself, why I wasn't doing it until I could finally do it. And I did it late, but I did it. And because I did it and I'm doing it and it's worked out, it's been a few years, worked out really well. I'm happy with what I have. I think I live in a little bit more gratitude Mm. than I otherwise would have. And that's something I look into a lot. That definitely, like you said, fulfills that idea, that I, the ideal of a happier life. Because I am, mm. it took me a while to get there, but I am doing what I want to do in the way that I want to do it. And so because of that, I am less likely to compare myself to other people or feel like I want to compete. I'm happy to be doing it the way that I'm doing it. Well, and... I've talked about on this show a lot of times about how the last work and stiff job I had a few years ago, I left it. And one of the things I did was started this podcast and I just wasn't willing to forego my wants anymore for the sake of security. And I've struggled in ways that I wouldn't struggle Otherwise, might not have. But I'm so much happier. It just doesn't even compare. And what it really boils down to for me is probably my favorite quote at this point in my life is a Bob Dylan quote. A man is a success if he wakes up in the morning and goes to bed at night and in between he does what he wants to do. And that's really, that's all I want for my life. I just want to be able to spend my time doing the things that I want to do instead of someone else having control over my time. And to be in a position where even if it's not perfect, I can do that. Like most of the time, if I'm doing work for someone else, I can say no to them. (laughs) There's a lot to be said for that kind of freedom. It's a big deal. And you experience it, too, in private practice. If you don't want to see a client, you don't have to see a client. And the thing is, it may be best for them or for me. Not every client is my client, and I'm not the best person for every client. And knowing that and and having the freedom to to be honest in that way, because if you're, you're in an agency, you are tethered to who you are assigned to and whatever that is, that is, and you serve based on that. And that it's a great challenge. I mean, it's it's a great challenge to prepare you and to stretch our limitations, to go beyond our comfort level and to discover, Hey, you know what? I didn't think I could work with people like this. And I've discovered that I can, and not only can I, but I'm actually really good at it. And maybe I even prefer this. Now there's some, satisfaction in it that makes it something that I want to be doing. So that's a cool experience too. But uh, I think, like you said, we all, we want freedom. 
Yeah, and I know in certain times of my life, it has just seemed so unattainable. I think a lot of us feel stuck in life. Maybe that's another topic that would be good to talk about with someone on your podcast, that idea of when do I make the decision, particularly in a private practice, that I'm not the best practitioner for this person. Or, you know, it could be a matter of what you need is outside my scope of practice. You know, you need DBT and I'm not trained in it or whatever it is, you know, but sometimes it could also be, I just don't, I don't think I'm the best person to help this particular human being. I actually had that recently. You know, I got a call from someone who was referred to me and I was exploring it. and. The problem was of a level of severity that gave me a little bit of anxiety as I was listening. I was trying to picture myself doing what they were asking me to do, and it gave me a little bit of anxiety. And when I thought about the severity of the problem and the age of the individual, there's that moment that you come to where you said, this is a little bit beyond me. And I have to put pride aside in order to recognize that that, that is what is going on. And that there's an element of service too, which, you know, in this case, I think was a psychiatric evaluation and what medication, what role medication might play in that, in that case that really needed to be considered and triaged before they would come to therapy for what they wanted me to do, which was EMDR and like trauma work. And it just didn't feel right. So I Mm -hmm. referred them on to a psychiatrist and I said, have your your child evaluated here and see what's going on there because these symptoms that you're talking about, they sound like it might be beyond the reach of psychotherapy. This this might be someone who has some primary psychiatric condition that, that needs to be treated first. And you, you mm-hmm. we might be going down the wrong road. I don't want to contribute to anything that brings harm to people. Of course, yeah. Well... This podcast is going to be fun. I'm, I'm so looking forward to it. I'm really excited about it. You know, I know it's going to be great and I know you're going to enjoy it. And if you have an experience anywhere near like mine, it's going to satisfy you in ways that you don't see yet. And I was thinking about this recently after one of our conversations earlier in the week. I mean, when you and I became friends, there was there. It was about ten years, twelve years before podcasts were even a thing. And to think that at this point, after sort of the evolution of each of our careers, that we get an opportunity to do something creative together. I mean, we tried to work together once again a few years ago, and that really it wasn't meant to be, and was probably a low light in each of our careers. The word the word catastrophic <laughs> comes to mind. Insane. Insane. I would that might be an appropriate label as well. But even that good came from that too for me. And I'm sure it did for you too. If nothing else, the power of experience. Of course. I mean yeah, there's a, there's value in all of it. You learn something, you build new relationships, you move forward. You figure out the next thing. It's all okay. I don't I don't live with a whole lot of regrets. Yeah. But my point is to have another opportunity to do something more like this, I think I think is what we probably needed to do anyway. Yeah. This is awesome. I appreciate Thank it, you. man. All right. It's gonna be fun. No, and I appreciate you willing to take me on as a um, your Padwan podcast learner, you know, Padwan. Tell me what that means. That's a cultural reference that I'm not familiar. It's from with. it's from Star Wars in the Jedi Knights. The Padwan is the Padwan learner, like you know, if Obi Wan Kenobi takes you on, or or okay. you. So Luke was the Padwan. Yeah, at one at one point he was a Padwan. Well, I'm flattered that you would sort of indirectly call me a Jedi. I, I did do that. Did do that. <laughs> All right, well, uh, this is great, man. I'll be talking to you. The Path 
to Authenticity proudly supports the I Speak Media Foundation, advancing media literacy education through an evolving series of outreach programs within the communities that need it most. For more information, visit ispeakmedia.org. All right, there you go, Eric Bricker. Hope you enjoyed the show, and I hope you'll check out Good Counsel when it's released. I'll be keeping you guys posted. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating or a review at Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, wherever you listen. If you know someone who you think would enjoy this or any episode, Try to make it really easy for you to forward a link to them from the website, thepathtoauthenticity.com. If you have questions or comments, you can call and leave a voice message at 561-247-4757. I'd love to hear any feedback you might have to offer. For early access to the newest episodes as well as unedited interviews, archived episodes you can support the show on patreon that's patreon.com slash the path to authenticity for patreon patrons i also do something i call saturday dispatch which is just a little check-in episode i want to thank the band punk rock opera whose music you hear throughout the show their songs are used with permission from the artist and under a Creative Commons license. Thank you to the sponsors, The Manor and Windrose Recovery, Her Escape Vortex. I want to thank Wendy Chin at Equivox. And as always, The Path to Authenticity is proud to support the I Speak Media Foundation. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, both at The Path to Authenticity. I'm also all over Clubhouse. Starting to do some weeknight rooms with a club called Bread for the Head that has nearly 2,000 members. That's a great place to connect if you're interested in that. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you investing the time in me and in this show. Have a great week. Be nice.
We need a guitar player. This episode was brought to you by Equivox. For digital marketing or web design services, visit Equivox.com.